morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Delphine adeno Ousu, the Executive Director of UCAN. The EU Chamber of Commerce in Canada is an advocacy body in charge of disseminating CETA information and, of course, supports EU-Canada trade relations. If you are new here, I invite you to visit UCAN's website to get information about CETA and how you can benefit from it. You can also follow us on social media, mostly Twitter and LinkedIn, to get the latest news. Today is the episode number 10 of the series of our webinar One Week, One Province with British Columbia and we are organizing this event with the EU Chamber of Commerce in Canada West. Tomorrow is our final episode <coughs> sorry, with the three northern provinces of Canada, which are Northwest Territories, Nunavut and Yukon. You still have time to register, so I will share the link later in the chat box. After the, the presentations of today, we will have the Q&A session, so please uh, ask all your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Now, I would like to introduce the, our speakers of the day. First, we have uh, Paul Arin, who is the Executive Director uh, of uh, Stakeholder Engagement at the Ministry of Job, Economic Recovery and Innovation. We also have from the Ministry, Janet Lam. She's the Director of Natural Resources, Export Market and Investor Services. We then have Janet Jackson, she's the CEO of Foresight Cleantech Accelerator Center. She will introduce uh, her, her center. And then we will have a testimonial from De uh, Daniel J uh, Jones, sorry, CEO of Vaudeville Sound. So now I will start by sharing um, a video with you. I am coming, sorry. And then we will go to the presentation. British Columbia is Canada's westernmost province, stretching from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. BC is recognized globally as a top business destination. We're a hub for innovation and creativity. Our world-leading post-secondary institutions attract students from all around the world, producing a diverse and highly skilled workforce to drive our economy and your success. And as we rapidly approach our goal of 100% high-speed connectivity, we're helping BC companies using advanced technologies establish themselves as global pioneers in information communications technology and wireless, life sciences, film, television, and visual effects, digital media and interactive, financial technology, aerospace, marine technology, and sustainable natural resource development that engages indigenous communities as partners and in agri-food and seafood products that meet the highest quality standards. We benefit directly from strong trading relationships across the globe, acting as a market gateway between the Asia-Pacific region and North America. Our state-of-the-art deep-sea ports are ice-free year-round and up to nearly two and a half shipping days closer to Asian ports than other West Coast locations. Together with our extensive modern rail and highway system, British Columbia's Northern Corridor provides the easiest access between the world's two biggest economies. And Vancouver International Airport, consistently rated one of North America's best, makes traveling and business easy. BC's economy is powered by 98% clean, renewable electricity. And BC companies are world-class innovators in clean technology for energy and transportation. Our commitment to the environment and our planet is an important part of who we are. We're one of the world's most sought after tourism destinations with world-class cities, spectacular natural wonders, and the widest range of lifestyle opportunities. These and so many other reasons give British Columbia a natural advantage. Learn more about BC at BritishColumbia.ca. Great, so over to you, Paul and Janet, to know more about uh, BC trade and investment opportunities. Great. Well, thanks, Delphine, and good morning, everybody. It's great to participate in the EU Chamber's um, One Week, One Province series. Um, and we're getting towards the end, uh, saving the best for last here in British Columbia. We're happy to, uh, to be part of this. Um, as Delphine mentioned, uh, I'm just going to move my that. Um, just have to, there we go. Um, our plan today is to provide a bit of an overview uh, introduction to a range of different sectors, both on the tech and the uh, natural resources side here in British Columbia uh, with my colleague Jeanette Lamb. Then we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive in the area of the clean tech sector here in BC. Some really exciting uh, dialogue and uh, exchanges going on between BC and Europe 
and we're joined by Jeanette Jackson from Foresight uh, Clean Tech Accelerator. And then um, uh, Daniel Jones is going to give us a bit of a, his perspective on um, being established as a, a European uh, company based here in BC and what he's found are the advantages. So welcome to British Columbia. We're Canada's third largest province. We're equal in size to uh, Germany, Spain, and Portugal combined. We have a diversified economy um, built on traditional natural resource sectors, but with a fast growing uh, tech uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, British Columbia is more than Vancouver, obviously our best known city. Uh, we have uh, some exciting emerging regional hubs around the province uh, in the Okanagan Valley around uh, wine and agri-food. Uh, as well as technology in uh, the Caribou region around forest innovation and in the north and east around mineral extraction and natural gas. We're committed to growing a cleaner economy here in BC and that uh, forms uh, our priorities in terms of uh, investment in the, sort of the province. And we're also very supportive of uh, reconciliation with Indigenous communities and Indigenous people in our province. And we'll touch more on that as later uh, as well. We have a diverse and multicultural workforce here in BC uh, with strong ties internationally. So it's a, it's a great place to do business and connect uh, with the world. Here's a, a brief snapshot of BC's economy. Uh, as you can see, about 50% of our um, economy is, is on, based on the natural resources sector, forestry, mining, energy, and agri-food, but we also have a fast-growing tech and services sector as Western Gateway Province, as you'll see about 14% of our services uh, are based on moving people and goods in and out of our ports and uh, airports. And here's a snapshot of what BC exports to the world. And this very much uh, is in line with the, the exports that we have to the European Union. Uh, about 2.4 billion, about 1.55 billion uh, euro last year in exports to Europe, uh, with uh, some of our uh, major markets being the Netherlands and Germany. Of course, uh, the UK is a strong export market for uh, BC as well. And so we're very happy that uh, Canada and the UK have, uh, have confirmed a, a trade continuity agreement to uh, support those uh, export ties as well. But we see enormous opportunities under CETA and we're working to uh, bring those uh, benefits and, and introduce CETA to BC companies through a range of different workshops and, uh, and, and seminars and other events. Uh, I understand there's a, sort of a range of, uh, of companies that are involved uh, on the call today. And uh, so we'll just touch briefly on uh, a whole range of different sectors, both on the tech and natural resources side, and happy to talk about any others during the Q&A. So turning first to uh, BC's uh, tech ecosystem, this is our fastest growing industry sector. In fact, the fastest growing in Canada uh, in terms of job uh, creation and revenue growth. Over 10,000 companies, and we anticipate over the next uh, eight to 10 years, we'll double the size of our tech uh, workers in the province. Here are some of the anchor tech companies that uh, call BC or have a presence here at home. Homegrown uh, includes companies like Sierra Wireless. Uh, international includes uh, uh, Amazon and, and Microsoft. Uh, Asian companies, but also German. You'll see uh, SAP, German software, uh, uh, company uh, is one of the largest employers in downtown Vancouver, has about 1,400 uh, staff. Uh, BC is home to three of Canada's five tech unicorns, um, and uh, that includes uh, Slack Technologies, which was founded in BC, as well as uh, Hootsuite and Avigilant. So turning first to information and communication technology, uh, we have more than 5,000 companies in this space involved in the design, manufacturing, and engineering of wired and wireless uh, communication, software design, cloud computing, Internet of Things. Uh, our, our sector is supported by a, a vibrant uh, accelerator community to support uh, early stage vent uh, tech ventures. 
And we have established uh, angel investor networks as well with ties into the United States to Silicon Valley and uh, Washington State and Asia. BC has a tech fund, a uh, $100 million venture capital fund that invests in emerging tech companies. And uh, we're an emerging quantum computing cluster uh, uh, anchored by companies like uh, D-Wave. And BC just announced that it's going to invest uh, another $17 million over the next five years to uh, establish a new quantum ag algorithms institute at SFU. Turning to digital media, media and interactive gaming, uh, we're home to one of the world's largest digital entertainment hubs. Uh, Vancouver is rated as the second largest uh, VR, AR ecosystem in the world. Companies like Microsoft Canada, Cloudhead, Archiact, working uh, on new applications uh, in, in education, healthcare, other, uh, other sectors as well. We're home to the oldest and still one of the top performing video game clusters in the world as well in uh, BC with over 150 companies on console and mobile games as well. And uh, our companies are focused on sustainability. Finger Foods, one of our uh, VR companies was one of the first Canadian companies to achieve carbon positive status. Turning to life sciences, uh, again, uh, we're one of the largest uh, life sciences clusters in Canada behind um, Quebec and Ontario, home to about 300 companies and about 50 research institutes. Uh, the University of British Columbia alone has spun off about 100 uh, life sciences companies and raised about $2 billion in private investment. We have expertise in oncology, genomics, personalized medicine, HIV, AIDS, um, and um, we've had uh, quite a bit of interest, including from German healthcare firms that are interested in investing and being part of our ecosystem. So uh, taking a step back just around innovation in BC, um, I think what underscores this is the way in which uh, our private sector works with government and also with the academic community here in BC. So on the left-hand side, you see some of our research uh, centers in BC uh, doing um, some real world leading research in the area of climate change, health outcomes for cancer and HIV, ocean research and bioenergy. We're home to Canada's uh, National Particle Accelerator, Triumph, doing work with, uh, with, with Germany's Max Planck Institute. We're home to the digital media supercluster, excuse me, the digital technology supercluster. Uh, a Canadian initiative uh, that's supported also by the BC uh, government to foster innovation and in precision health, uh, data commons and digital twins. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you see some of the uh, industry associations, accelerators, incubators that are supporting and growing uh, our clean tech company, growing uh, new ventures, marketing our tech sector in internationally and uh, running investor forums uh, as well. I won't speak too much about our, uh, tech, uh, our clean tech sector. I'll leave that to Jeanette Jackson to touch on a little bit later, uh, but just to highlight that we're ranked uh, one of the top 10 in the world and home to about a quarter of Canada's clean tech companies. Uh, I will just touch briefly though on Clean BC. Clean BC, uh, like the EU Green Plan, this is our uh, plan for hitting our GHG emission reduction targets. Uh, launched uh, two years ago, uh, it's really not only about hitting those targets, but about growing new clean energy jobs uh, in the province. And uh, it features a range of uh, rebate and uh, incentive programs for BC-based companies in areas like building retrofitting, clean transportation, waste to energy, and industrial electrification. As the video highlighted, um, we see our competitive advantage as clean, affordable hydroelectricity, and we're using that to decarbonize economy, our economy and transportation, the built sector, as well as uh, industrial processes. BC also has a carbon tax and we're uh, redistributing uh, the revenues into uh, helping industry uh, clean up and clean their processes, uh, electrify industrial and transportation sectors. 
uh, but still about 25% it will be through uh, future reductions and that's where we see uh, there's tremendous opportunity for, for uh, clean growth technology companies uh, to, uh, to set up and, and uh, establish a presence here in BC. Um, in terms of manufacturing uh, in our province, uh, this is not as large a sector as uh, Quebec and Ontario. Uh, but it does constitute about 60% of our um, exports, our manufactured goods, largely in the uh, food beverage uh, sector, as well as forestry and mining products. Uh, but we also have um, some niche sectors in the area of shipbuilding, aerospace, apparel. Uh, we're home to companies like Lululemon and uh, Arcteryx, as well as cannabis. Uh, in terms of the aerospace sector, uh, we take advantage of our proximity to the Pacific Northwest in terms of uh, aerospace manufacturing and production lines, which has helped to grow out um, uh, value-added companies and, and uh, parts production in that sector. Uh, but we do have homegrown world leaders, uh, MDA in the area of satellite communication, uh, Viking Air in, uh, in, in terms of aircraft manufacturing happy to talk about uh, more later. Just before I turn it over to uh, Jeanette Lamb, uh, just to highlight once again uh, BC's commitment to um, uh, uh, reconciliation with the Indigenous people who have lived in British Columbia for, for millennia. Uh, last year we passed legislation to affirm the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and we see, that as, uh, see this as a path forward to respecting their rights and uh, agency and uh, over their, uh, their lands as well. It's a tool we believe to uh, establish rules, transparency, accountability, and uh, to add further certainty to investment uh, decisions and to create space for Indigenous people to be involved uh, and exercise uh, economic leadership. So with that, I'm going to turn it to my colleague, uh, Jeanette Lamb, uh, to uh, talk about uh, in uh, some of our natural resource sectors. Thank you, Paul. Um, so with natural gas, um, we have about 150 years worth of natural gas supply and new discoveries are being made all the time. Um, we're also committed to investing in electrification of our upstream and oil and gas production. And, um, is focused on making our gas production actually the cleanest in the world. In Canada and BC's energy developments, we're committed to protecting our air, land and water, and we're expecting um, our partnerships with First Nations. And these partnerships are, uh, support responsible economic development opportunities and deliver better sustainable projects for all, and also guaranteeing jobs and training opportunities for all British Columbians. As such, um, Royal Dutch Shell is a joint venture participant in LNG Canada, and this is a 40 billion project, which is the largest private sector investment in Canadian history. LNG Canada is expected to create up to 10,000 jobs during construction and 950 permanent jobs in northern BC once operations are underway. Further site preparation for construction of the 1.6 billion wood fiber LNG export facility on Howe Sound in BC is set to begin the third quarter of 2021. When built, wood fiber LNG will, power the, uh, will be powered by renewable hydroelectricity, making it the cleanest LNG facility in the world, providing over 100 full-time jobs. As Canadian LNG facilities move forward, they generate opportunities in construction and operations, as well as upstream exploration and development. We also see opportunities for BC to play a leading role in LNG marine bunkering. BC Ferries, um, which is one of the largest ferry operations in Northern uh, North America, has actually converted their vessels to operate on natural gas, which is much cleaner uh, for the environment than marine diesel. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So with respect to mining, um, we have very rich natural resources and 150 years experience in mining history. Mineral exploration, mining, and related sectors contribute about 9.5 billion to BC's GDP last year, providing over about 45,000 direct jobs to BC. BC has vast deposits of copper, molybdenum, gold, silver, lead, zinc, and more than 30 industrial minerals. We exported about 13.4 billion worth of mine products last year. BC is also the home to the world's largest 
concentration of mining and exploration companies and mining professionals with over 1,000 mining companies based here, of which about 80 are major global firms um, within uh, North America with headquarters here. Um, exploration projects results in benefits for nearby communities, particularly in rural communities where deposits are located. The industry also provides thousands of spin-off jobs and opportunities for suppliers and service providers located close to these projects. BC has an opportunity to be a world leader in responsible mineral exploration and extraction, and this government is dedicated to supporting that objective. Our mining companies have proven success working with local communities, engaging with indigenous leaders, and prioritizing environmental responsibility. As investors focus more on ESG factors, BC mining is well positioned. We're also looking to expand our ties with EU. So next week, um, there will be an Ireland and BC mining exploration webinar. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, forestry. So BC is one of the world's largest exporters of wood products, including wood, pulp, timber, lumber, and other forest products. Within our forest sector, our focus is on sustainable forest management and production practices. So 14% of the world's certified forests are here in BC, and this is more than 50 million hectares of certified forests. This traditional resource industry is expected to grow through innovation, so using remote sensing technologies for forest management to conducting 3D and X-ray scanning for logs when, before they are milled. BC can learn from Europe's long experience with innovative forest products. Also, there are opportunities for European investments in mills and forestry operations, manufacturing of forestry products and biofuels. We continue to grow the wood pellet sector, transferring wood waste to thermal energy. The sector currently contributes 400 million per year to our economy. Pinnacle Renewable Energy is the third largest producer in the world here in BC. Leading export markets for BC wood pellets is Europe, and this is due to the green energy policies in the EU, which has resulted in increased pellet demand from BC. We're also committed to grow innovation around engineered wood products like cross laminated timber panels to construct taller and larger wood buildings. That affords seismic safety and also uh, pr produces a low carbon footprint. BC also has made changes to the building code to encourage mass timber construction up to 12 stories using fire resistant engineered wood. And BC is home to one of the tallest wooden buildings in the world. This is the 18 story Brock Commons at UB University of British Columbia or UBC. We are focused on mass timber projection and use, which is also part of our economic recovery plan. Mass timber is projected to grow steadily in the coming decades as jurisdictions look to reduce emissions and support a circular economy. Innovative biomaterials are also developed by our research institute, FP Innovations, using cellulose filament technology to improve the quality of textiles, plastics, and rubbers. Next slide. Thank you. So in 2019, BC exported 4.7 billion worth of agriculture, seafood, and food beverages products to 152 international markets. We see opportunities to further expand BC exports, agri-food exports to Europe under CETA. We also see opportunities for investment and partnerships with Europe, particularly in agri-tech. And BC is known for quality research and educational institutions that offer agricultural programs. As a result, the educational infrastructure has the potential to positively impact productivity and labor availability, as well as attract investments to BC's innovative clusters to improve efficiency, competitiveness, and productivity that actually meets our food security needs. Um, I would also mention that uh, we, we also have an agri-tech agreement with the Netherlands, and we're also working very closely with the Consulate of the Netherlands to advance cooperative cooperation on agri-tech. Some notable BC companies in this space, and many that are producing world-class innovations, include Semios, which provides real-time crop data and pest management tools for tree fruit and nut growers, and they were actually named the 2019 Global Clean Tech Top 100. We also have Equation, uh, which has developed autonomous scout robots that monitors the health of plants. Um, this company was received, uh, I believe, the 2018 Green Tech Innovation Concept Award in Amsterdam. Uh, next to our business advantages. Um, here are some advantages of doing business in BC to consider. Um, so in short, 
We're a competitive, flexible, and supportive business climate. We have talented workforce and an education institution providing cutting edge research and a supply of job ready graduates. BC is also a great place to work and live and is strategically located for business for both Europe and Asia. We also have a cost competitive jurisdiction. Um, next slide. Thank you. We have a growing labor pool of more than 2.5 million workers in British Columbia. Our highly educated, multilingual, and motiva motivated workforce is responsible for the needs of businesses across industry sectors. Next slide. Approximately 7,000 temporary and foreign workers and international mobility permits are granted each year in British Columbia. The BC Provincial Nominee Program is a way for high demand foreign workers and experienced entre entrepreneurs to gain permanent residency in BC. The Skills Immigration and Express Entry BC stream supports BC employers to attract and retain talent by providing an immigration pathway for skilled and semi-skilled workers. Next slide. Thank you. There are 25 publicly funded universities, colleges, and institutes, along with 17 private post-secondary institutions that produce a steady supply of skilled graduates. Close to 70% of our workers have obtained post-secondary credentials at the certificate level or higher, um, with almost 30% holding a university degree. University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser, Simon Fraser University rate the national top 10 engineering computer science. And together with other universities produce 3,000 engineering and 1,500 computer science graduates annually. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we're ranked number three in Mercer's most livable cities in the world, along with many European cities. Our high quality of life draws and retains skilled and creative people. This makes it easier for businesses in British Columbia to find and retain the right employees. Next slide. Thank you. As Canada's Pacific Gateway, British Columbia businesses day conveniently overlaps with the afternoon hours of Europe and morning ske work schedules in Asia and synchronizes with the full working days of California and Washington State. Next slide. So we're talking about um, com competitive operating costs and tax structures. So BC has a competitive tax environment that has the lowest personal income tax in Canada for single individuals earning up to 125,000. BC's general corporate income tax rate is 12%. And so when this is combined with the federal rate, businesses pay an overall rate of just 27%. Other costs of doing business in British Columbia can also lower, be lower than other locations in North America. And these also include labor costs, power, and facilities. Next slide. So how we can help. Our teams in Europe here in BC uh, can support you in exploring business opportunities through the province and some of the services include strategic support to help you uh, implement your investment decisions, business service connections and establishing a new enterprise here in BC, tours, introductions and events to help investors make connections with uh, and, and also evaluate opportunities. And also for the government programs, um, we can help you navigate through the federal, provincial, and local government support programs that can help you address your business needs. Last and but, uh, last and but not least, um, in our BC, thank you. We have a dedicated trade, and, trade and investment representative based in Europe with team members based in Germany and the Netherlands, as well as the UK to support BC's interests across the EU. Um, please feel free to reach out to, uh, directly to Paul and I, but also to these contacts um, who are in UA, U, sorry, EU based, should you look to do business in British Columbia. Um, thank you very much. Over to you, Paul. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Jeanette. And now we'll move from um, one Jeanette to another. I believe I have to stop sharing screen. And uh, uh, I'll invite uh, Jeanette Jackson to, uh, to queue up her presentation um, and talk a little more deeply about uh, clean tech in uh, BC. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me and see the presentation? Looks good. 
Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so thank you everyone for having me. Good, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on uh, where you are on this uh, presentation today. My name is Jeanette Jackson. I'm the CEO of Foresight Cleantech Accelerator Center here in British Columbia. I think we all know now that cleantech has become a truly transformative, enabling technology uh, for so many different sectors. And it's an honor to be leading an organization in British Columbia that's here to really help position BC as a global leader in clean tech um, through a series of different programs and initiatives. So I'm going to share a little bit uh, with you uh, on that today. So about foresight, our motto is energizing clean tech and uh, it's no secret that the team here is a very busy team, uh, high energy, extremely passionate about the sector. Um, and we really look at ourselves as a group of thought leaders and change makers that are working together collaboratively to ensure a prosperous future for Canadian clean tech, both domestically and abroad. And so obviously when we talk about exports and partnerships with our colleagues in Europe, this is really, really an important uh, bucket of activity that we're engaged on. We are focused on fueling the identification, commercialization and adoption of the clean technologies needed to address the world's most urgent climate challenges. So whether it's food and water security or energy, built environment, transportation, all of these fit under the foresight umbrella. A little bit about our business model. We take a very holistic approach to acceleration. So while we started off as an early, early stage company accelerator, we now use the term ecosystem acceleration. And here's a few um, reasons why. The first is that we're really here to break down silos. Um, the startup and innovation community is fundamental to everything that we do, but it's really important that industry, academia, government and investors are at the table to create an environment where these companies can scale and grow. We also work very hard to accelerate adoption. So we have different strategic uh, programs and opportunities where industry can identify gaps, identify needs, and essentially go to the innovation community and source those technologies that will help them reach their various climate goals. And then of course, in terms of scaling technology, as both Paul and Jeanette have outlined, there's a great environment here for scaling, whether it's talent, manufacturing capabilities, and quite frankly, a robust, uh, a, it's a growing investor climate is what, is what I'll say. And if you've been following along some of the announcements, there's a new uh, strategic innovation fund in BC as well that I think is going to have a huge impact, not only in clean tech, but in life sciences and some of those other sectors where we're, we're very excited about. Digging a little deeper into our stakeholder engagement model, uh, and this will build into one of our special initiatives that I'll get into in a minute here. But SMEs, we take a pretty direct approach with the startup community. We wanna make sure they have the right team, value proposition and business model to compete. So we accept everyone and then we help them figure out, do you have those special, you know, can, can you check all those boxes so that when you go out internationally, uh, you can really sell to, to the international uh, community. From an industry perspective, we do provide structure. Um, industry across the board is at different stages in their understanding of sustainability and clean tech and ESG at the governance level. And so we provide a structured approach to helping industry identify where are they? Are you at the road mapping phase? Do you already know some of your gaps and we could do some reverse pitch programming? Or do we do a deep dive and really figure out technically how can we help you evolve your value chain uh, to be more competitive and of course sustainable? From an investor perspective, with over 300 active ventures in our community, uh, we obviously look at, are looked at as a, a strong deal flow opportunity. Um, most of the companies are earlier stage, but uh, about 25% have reached the sort of technology readiness level nine and are fully commercial. So there's a, a good spread in terms of the companies and where they are in their uh, commercialization journey. And for academia, Academia plays a very critical role. It's not only validating technologies that are out there, but a, a, a tremendous source for problem-driven innovation, especially when we're working on those industry innovation challenges. And of course, government, whether it's policy, uh, support for accelerators like Foresight, uh, they really provide a good foundation to, uh, to have that robust community of, of innovation and, and scale up. In terms of our programming, I talked a little bit about this. We have our Launch, Deliver and Grow program. I'll, I'll focus mostly on the Deliver program because it's quite unique. Uh, a lot of organizations support the CEO to go out and raise money and, and again, get their value prop uh, customer discovery in place. 
but the deliver program focuses on the CTO, making sure that you know when the when the CEO determines that these are the right customers that we want to go after, that the product and technology roadmap and the optimized path to your minimum viable product is really on point. So that program is pretty unique to uh, to our accelerator. And then of course, lots of different strategic partnerships, industry innovation challenges, cluster building, which I'm very excited about, and market research. Uh, we are very much market and data driven. So that plays a re really significant role in, in all of our function and activity. And so today I wanted to dive in a little bit on one of our most exciting initiatives, which is the new VC Core cluster strategy for the province of British Columbia. It was formally launched in July of 2020 after engagement with over a thousand stakeholders throughout the province by region, stack, sector, and stakeholder group. Sorry, a little bit of a bug there. Um, and then building on that, you can see the report at corecleantech.com. It's 80 pages, but there are there's a good executive summary there. It's really a roadmap on how we continue to invest and take a programmatic approach to making sure that clean tech could be one of BC's top employers, exports, and overall driver for our, the growth of our economy. And the future economy series there is quite interesting. If you're interested in specific verticals, there's some good reports that you might want to reference if you're interested in doing business in BC or learning about what we have here to export to your regions. We also take not only a regional, but a sectoral approach to cluster activity. We recently launched the Water Next initiative, which is a dynamic collaborative approach to ecosystem and network building. We are a hub, but we connect, of course, with other groups across Canada. Collaboration across Canada is very important uh, for, for us. Um, and so making sure that uh, we showcase what water innovation that we have here in BC, as well as how that connects to other uh, ecosystems across Canada. There's a great resource on our website if you're interested in learning more about all of the 400 ventures in Canada, in particular BC, um, but there's some great information there. Water is a definitely, when it comes to food security and water security, it's gonna be a very important topic for us in moving ahead. Our success to date, so we've supported over 500 ventures. We currently have 300 active ventures in our programming. Obviously, you know, when a company scales, they have the opportunity to continue to grow or exit. So we obviously have a portfolio of companies that have exited. We don't invest directly in the companies, but we definitely help them facilitate engagement with investors. And we've, we've sort of tracked over a quarter of a billion dollars in investment uh, that we've sort of helped support with those ventures. And the company revenues have started to increase. I mean, in light of COVID, uh, clean tech and sustainability, as all of us know, has become a very prime conversation and, and the ventures are obviously benefiting from that. We've tracked about 5,000 green jobs from our actions uh, and of course, industry engagement challenges, um, some other great metrics there if you're interested in more. So if you do go to the report, um, the purpose of the core cluster is to, by 2030, position British Columbia to be an established clean tech cluster with a global reputation for rapidly building, scaling, and anchoring technology companies that address uh, climate change. We also wanna focus on enhancing industry competitiveness and making sure that the benefits that everyone's uh, seeing in the clean tech sector is distributed in terms of shared sustainable prosperity uh, and of jobs, uh, economic attraction, investment attraction is all, is all a key part of that. We've designed a pretty unique framework for how we're approaching cluster development. Obviously, the uh, Helix 5 stakeholders that I mentioned before is, is very important, but we also like to bucket it by other functions. So we've outlined talent, markets, capital, network, technology validation, and policy as key components. And so in our report, you'll see ways that you can engage, whether it's um, you know, some things that we've talked about in particular with the egg tech file and, and the Netherlands is how do we have our, some of our students go to Europe and some of those students come here so we can learn from each other and, and really make sure that we're competitive and, and focused on the best and the brightest when it comes to egg tech. And that, of course, filters into other sectors as well. And the ultimate impact that we're looking to have is jobs, investment, exports, and partnerships. Everything we do is that collaborative partnership approach. You know, building on Paul and Jeanette's presentation as well, we've identified the key sectors where we have competitive advantage in clean tech, so resources, built environment, energy, transportation, water, agriculture, and food. Uh, for the water space, we have folks like Saltworks and Axine. For mining, there's a really cool organization here called MindSense. 
On the energy front, we have clear and carbon engineering. One thing that we're also starting to see is a trend uh, with clean tech companies that have a unique business model or perhaps they're even a digital clean tech model. So that really is changing the game when it comes to the capital requirements required to launch and scale some of these ventures. Now, for recent activities, we have been very busy. If you haven't been following along on our social media, you should. Um, but we are pretty engaged with Europe on a few fronts. We're part of the International Clean Tech Network. It's a partnership of global clusters that help SME ac acceleration and internationalization. Um, it focuses on a few sectors, energy, circular economy, and water. Obviously, there's other buckets that fit in there, but those are the priorities right now. And ultimately, it opens up an access to exclusive networks, um, especially with uh, industry partners uh, around the world. We also ran an EU Connect series, so in partnership with the BC Consulate Network um, and clusters at Climate Week 2020. So uh, that happened in September, October, and we did uh, three sessions on fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell, power management, circular economy, followed by a fourth day of delegate conversations. What do we actually do to build these partnerships and some really interesting findings came out of that and i'd love to action some of those if, if folks on the line would like to talk more about that and over 800 attendees um, for those sessions and then some sector specific stuff i mentioned the future economy series you can see some roadmap information there um, and then of course the water cluster ecosystem map we just launched that uh, yesterday actually so you can see all of these ventures on a, on a live map and and see where they are what they do and links to their website and then we're, we're also working on a pretty robust circular bioeconomy project. There was a session uh, last week and some great presentations of innovators and in industry, Ford Motors, Lafarge, um, looking for uh, solutions uh, depending on their, our, their needs. Moving ahead, we will continue to build out our International Connect series with a focus on Europe. And then uh, we will be looking at uh, some early launch activity with Latin America and the US. We also want to follow up on our EU Connect uh, conversations. There's a, I think we're going to be running a, a session in the winter, I guess January to March, winter, um, uh, on all of the sort of trade opportunities, for CETA between, uh, between BC and, and uh, the EU. And then we will continue to work on the investor matchmaking sessions. And everyone on the line is welcome to attend. And if you're either a venture or an investor or an industry partner, we'd love to hear from you and, and loop you in. That's it for me. I hope that um, that covered everything you were expecting, uh, Paul and Jeanette, and I'll pass it back to the next speaker. Great. Thanks very much, um, Jeanette. And um, now just rounding out, um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Daniel Jones to share some perspectives. Uh, as um, you said, Daniel's the CEO of Vaudeville Sound, post-production uh, audio studio uh, with facilities in London and Brighton, as well as Los Angeles. Uh, the company has a strong uh, reputation for producing uh, premium sound design, editing, and, and mixing talent with some impressive uh, clients, including um, Disney, Apple, Netflix, BBC, and, and many more. Earlier this year, Vaudeville launched their first Canadian facility here in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, so we're great to welcome them to our ecosystem here in BC. So I thought maybe, um, Daniel, maybe you could lead off. Uh, just tell us a little more about uh, Vaudeville Sound and how you came to uh, the decision to establish a studio here in, uh, in BC. Thanks, Paul. Well, thanks for inviting me on today and uh, allowing me to tell a bit of our story about, yeah, how we open in Vancouver. Um, it was kind of five years in the making with my manager Mirko Vogel who runs place here and uh, he used to work for us back in the UK and um, decided about five years ago with his young family to uh, head out this way and basically brought the city to, and British Columbia to my attention. I hadn't been here before, I hadn't heard about it but obviously uh, in our world of audio post-production, we work a lot in film, television, commercials, digital platforms, uh, and our base in LA, uh, we immediately sort of realized this by its proximity to LA and time zone would be a, a good place to base ourselves. Um, but yeah, it's really started with um, Mirko uh, kind of had enough of London. <laughs> 
and had a little baby boy and they were looking for a, a better place to live and I think they've uh, found the spot but uh, so so as we sort of uh, had chats about what we could do here we looked into it and uh, luckily our other manager here Rob Calder who's a Vancouverite um, sort of brought us into the mix um, my first visit here was three years ago at the BC Tech Summit and that was a great opportunity to just meet the sort of community and sector we work in and um, it was just immediately obvious that this is a, a great a great place to base what we do and a lot of opportunity here and obviously it's Vancouver and BC have had a strong and long history of film and VFX and we're here to sort of add to that and to try and enhance the whole post-production side of that world as well and um, one of the things that also became obvious as we were researching this was that there's a huge amount of uh, talent, untapped talent here and uh, as your slides indicated earlier there's a lot about I think about the schooling and uh, there's a sort of young workforce but really it's uh we've been very fortunate to just find a great talented pool of people here um above and beyond some of the other places we've been looking and uh and everyone's just very creative very keen and um that in turn has helped us since opening here to be more innovative and this is our first site where we actually have an r d department of sorts and that has led us into the whole gaming world which we weren't in before um the vr ar world obviously from our audio creative base approach and um yeah it's already opened a lot of doors and i think that is credit to the city the people here that it's just uh, very inviting and very easy to meet people and i and also what what we do we work in many languages and i think it's such a cosmopolitan and international place that on the talent front it's been really helpful for us to find uh, people from all nationalities as we we work we do reversioning and localization in sort of 20 odd languages so that's an important uh, thing for us but uh but yeah and the company here is just one year old and uh, incorporated in October then we built our facility and we proudly opened that on March 12th and then we uh, sadly shut it on March the 13th due to uh, the whole uh, COVID issues so it's been a it's been a challenging year but even within that it's been actually really really great year here and um, yeah hoping hoping when we can open the doors a bit more next year hopefully at some point then we can uh, really invite everyone in but i think it's it's the for us the it's got a great geographical advantage linking to la but also the whole as you mentioned in your slide the pacific gateway and into asia and that's a market which we are looking into um yeah so all in all it's just got a really positive business climate and uh and getting to know the place i've really uh falling in love with BC for sure oh and also I wanted to um, thank Rhoda Campbell in London at the uh, well the European trade investment specialist Rhoda because uh, she was a great help in setting up I think we were quite lucky because Rob Calder local here Mirko our manager knew the place and settled here so we had an advantage that we were being introduced to people in our sector already, but um, everyone, including Rhoda, had been a, a real help as well, actually. So uh, thanks. And I haven't mentioned Brexit at all, so I'm quite proud of that. I was about to to actually <laughs> mention something. We we said we would not mention Brexit, but as they mentioned the B word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as you as you heard, I mean Daniel was already interested in BC and Vancouver way before uh, Brexit. So yeah, 
and it's always interesting to have anyway a feedback of a company and and why you choose the the this province so that's uh, that's great so yeah first i want to thank all our speakers because it was very interesting we have some few questions and few minutes to to deal with the questions um, so actually, you, you, you were mentioning uh, LA earlier, so I, I will go to that question. Uh, what are the unique skills in BC that are different, different from Washington, which is next door, and the Silicon Valley? So I don't know if maybe Paul or Janet, you want to get on well, the I question? Think, um, I think, um, you know, some of them that, uh, that Daniel has touched on, I think, you know, we're certainly, um, I think it's the multicultural and uh, uh, diverse nature of our workforce in uh, those those areas. So I think in addition to having the skills, the technical skills, the technology skills, uh, they also have uh, cross-cultural and linguistic skills. So a lot of companies are coming here, for example, to um, to work, uh, you know, Asian gaming companies and others. And uh, so, so uh, I think that's certainly one advantage. Uh, the other is just, um, you know, um, when when companies are looking around the world, uh, we have uh, competitive labor costs here in in BC as well compared to uh, Silicon Valley or Washington. Uh, but we are very very closely tied to uh, Washington State. Uh, we have uh, an initiative uh, called the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, and we work very very closely on a range of different. Uh, uh, initiatives uh, to advance uh, cooperation. We have um, both a representation BC, much like we have in Europe. We also have representation in uh, Seattle and uh, in um, in California as well. So uh, we work we work very closely with those communities, but increasingly. Um, uh, that makes it easier. Our labor costs, uh, getting in and out, getting visas, getting in and out of BC is easier for some for some international workers. Great. Um, I see that Janet uh, is, is answering my question. So this is great. This oh, is I'm no, sorry. It's, no, 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 it's, it's great. It actually leaves the floor for more questions. But uh, maybe also maybe Paul and, and, and Janet Lam, what are, I mean, if you have some like main event coming in 2021, um, whether it's uh, virtual or in-person, that would be of the interest of EU companies. If you have some events you would like to share, please let us know. Um. Sure, on the natural resource sector, um, we, uh, BC actually annually holds the AME Roundup in Vancouver. And so that's usually held every January. Um, and usually a lot of international investors, um, government, um, uh, international companies come uh, for a mining forum. Um, another one is the BC Natural Resources uh, um, Conference, but that's a little bit uh, smaller less of an international, it's more focused on BC, but people are more welcome to attend and it's based in Prince George and they focus on the natural resources sectors, forestry, mining, um, indigenous opportunities, business opportunities. So, so those are the two major ones. And then on the, um, Daniel men mentioned the Tech Summit, um, stay tuned, uh, but uh, we fully expect the Tech Summit will rise again. This was our annual event. Um, we're really brought together the entire uh, tech ecosystem in BC. It's an exciting event. I can't um, say enough about it in terms of uh, drawing people together in, and, and seeing everybody in one place. Um, and so uh, that has been um, paused this past year. So uh, we are looking to see whether that'll be um, you know, re reorganized uh, sometime later in 2021. Uh, we're, we're talking with uh, some of the consular core co consular officials we work quite closely with about other EU uh, delegations or uh, virtual delegations to BC, um, and about um, in in the area of clean tech and others. We will um, we can certainly put together um, a list of what we have coming up um, in the next uh, a little while and. Uh, our website, uh, BritishColumbia.ca, uh, lists all of our, our our major events. But happy to share more and th with you through you, Delphine, to your yep. members. As well. 
Great, great. And also um, for Janet from Foresight, I, ju I just wanted to mention to the audience because we, we, we had a question if there's any partnership between the Foresight cluster and European clusters. So um, in the email I will send later on today, I will share Janet's contact. I mean, feel free to, um, to contact her if you see there could be any synergies with the, with the, with the European clusters. We have a question on related to France. Uh, over 60 groups from France are present in BC and over 50 companies have been created in BC by entrepreneurs from France. In which sector could it be interesting for, for French, I guess, to invest more in, in, in BC? Well, um, again, uh, we would welcome it uh, in all. We work very closely, as I mentioned, with uh, with, uh, with the Consul General here, the French Consul General, we put together and there have been some great programs being put together uh, around technology last year, around uh, AR and uh, VR, A AI, I should say. Um, I think those are all, those tech sectors are, are uh, very interesting areas. Um, and uh, we're also discussing around uh, transportation decarbonization, and that might be another area that I think uh, we could work uh, with France. I think basically any of the areas um, in the clean tech environment uh, in particular are, are exciting opportunities to, to, to work with, uh, with French companies. We haven't really mentioned too much about um, uh, infrastructure or uh, that type of investment. Uh, but uh, BC is, um, you know, probably has about a billion dollars of projects, uh, infrastructure improvements, uh, uh, bridges, other, other uh, work. Uh, and so there might be also opportunities uh, for uh, French engineering companies to, to monitor as well in, uh, in that space. But happy to talk uh, with any companies um, and connect them to um, sort of uh, the ecosystem here in BC, uh, the industry associations, the consular corps, other groups, um, Alliance Francaise, all the groups that, uh, that uh, are connected uh, together here in BC. Great, uh, thank you very much. I, I don't know if there's any um, one more question or one more uh, comment from all our speakers today. I don't know if you want to say a final words, but if, words. But uh, yeah, I, ju I just also wanted to thank all of you today. It was very insightful. And again, to all the participants, I, I will share all the presentation and the contacts so you will have opportunity to be in touch with them. I don't know, if, Paul, if you want to say the, the final words. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, just uh, thank you so much, Delphine, for, for organizing it. And thanks to the two Jeanettes and Daniel for uh, taking the time. Uh, really appreciated your presentations. And for all of you uh, who tuned in, thank you very much. Um, we, uh, on our uh, PowerPoint that you're going to receive, uh, has our email address uh, as well as our connections into our uh, our, our Europe uh, trade investment team. And so we're gonna be very happy to, uh, to work uh, with you, follow up on any of the questions that you have and uh, continue working together. So thanks very much. Great, thank you very much. Thank you uh, all to all you, the speakers. It was really in, in Thanks for having us. Thank you to the particip participants. And remember to register for our last edition tomorrow. I dropped the link and you will have it in the email. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening or a great day, depending on, on where you are calling from. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.